grades and recommendations from college and and a Spanish language fluency, I thought I would be able to get a grant to go to graduate, graduate school. Mm -hmm. So my so sort of, I joined the Peace Corps to, I didn't really have any other plan and also to learn Spanish. Mm -hmm. But I got to Columbia and, uh, oh, marijuana, are you kidding me? Uh -huh. I have a couple of great stories about it. So this, is, this, is, this is April 1989. My dear friends, I was on lunch hour with friends and mentioned a poem that I had read My dear friends, I was on lunch hour with friends and mentioned a poem that I had read about murderous women. The conversation drifted to actual murders by women, and I said that among the natives of the Great Plains, it was a common practice in pre-Columbian days for captured warriors to be brought to the home camp so the women could torture them to death for the general amusement of all. I added that by extension, since most people on earth until very recently had lived in such tribal society, women had probably been willing and casual torturers for most of time. John, who carries some resentment over preferential treatment given to gender or race, jumped on this and dared me to put it in my next letter, telling me that if I did, any feminist who could read it would hurl the letter and a stream of invective back in my face. It could happen, but that sort of bigot is not, I think, among my readers, and if some or any are so deeply offended, well, goodbye. These letters are delivered about equally to the sexes, and I'm not writing to men or women, but directly to you. If you sense our kinship, uh, you may be with me intrigued by our shared history of torture, but if your feminist sensibilities have been hurt because women are different from men and would never ever have taken pleasure in the careful mutilation of a fallen enemy, you better quit reading. Last January, Rick, a friend and companion from my past, came to visit. He had not seen the letters that I had been writing for a couple of years, and I, who loved to read them aloud, seized the chance, selecting and reading some to him, including one that had not been generally distributed, but had rather gone out only to professional religious people. The gist of that letter was, evil is knowingly supported at the risk of the soul, both Democrat and Republican candidates advocate foreign policy that is evil. Voting for either is supporting such evil. Therefore, vote for someone, anyone, not advocating such evil uh, for the good of the soul. There had been only one response, a Methodist minister who agreed that both parties are evil, as no other candidate uh, had any chance of election, however, casting a vote for anyone else would simply not be practical. I wrote back, sending copies to other professional religious people too, asking how could a vote that was practical but immoral be justified? No one replied. When I finished reading these, Rick was quite frank and he told me that he understood why there had been no reply because what I had written was condemnatory rant, the sort of inflammatory rhetoric used by pro-life fundamentalists, the sort that no one should dignify with the reply. I said that it wasn't condemnation, but a question phrased as clearly and sincerely as I was able after years of thought, and then sent only to people who make their living as professional religious, who had represented an interest in moral questions. I reminded my friend that I am a low-level bureaucrat from an unfashionable neighborhood in a backwater town, and I lack the authority to condemn anyone for anything. What I'd written was sincere questioning that merited a reply, and if any recipient had held, had felt they were condemned, then they should justify themselves with a reasoned reply or change their evil ways. My friend again said boldly that the letter was condemnatory rant, unworthy of reply, and he's pretty sharp and he might be right, but I don't think so. While I was in South America in 1971, I came out it came out in major media that the USA had set up a school outside of Washington, D.C., where police and military from around the world are taught, at American taxpayer expense, physical techniques, like where to attach electrical wires, and psychological methods, such as sending electrical current through children in front of their parents for torture. At first, I would not believe it, as I was full of John Wayne and had no mental room for an image of evil America, 
but it continued to be reported in various sources, even Time magazine, and it was never disputed or denied. Today, in 1989, when I first wrote this, and in 1999, when it was recopied, and still today, as I put it in the computer in November of 2016, many graduates of our school are in positions of power around the world, indebted to us for their training and their power. If any feminist is offended by the reference to torture long ago and far away, let me point out that that has nothing to do with now and you. If women did tie some poor soul down and then burn and gouge him to death, what does that have to do with us? Nothing. But current torture by American trainees may not be disclaimed by assenting that is the work only of men. All people are enfranchised, we can all vote, we are all complicit. Just so, for any religious who are offended, our representative government has established a school of torture and has not apologized or forsworn to continue the vile practice. If anyone supports this, even tacitly or ignorantly, I want to offend you. Your conscience should bother you. You should be ashamed. Yet, many people feel our policy is justified because it's practical. They say it is a competitive world and a person and a nation must do what is necessary to be number one. Thinking of this reminds me of the four Germans that I met while traveling in Latin America. Rick and I had been seated on the same crag for hours before the tourist train crawled into sight around noon, so tiny in the depth of the canyon that it would hardly have been noticed except for the movement and the puffs of smoke. I was sorry to see it slow and stop because that meant someone was getting off to make the ascent to where we sat in beautiful shade. Company coming, commented Rick. We'd made the ascent the day before, getting off the train where a foot suspension bridge is hung across the Urubamba River a few kilometers before the tourist train station stop below Machu Picchu. After the train pulled away, we'd swayed across the river, enjoying the cool breeze above the rushing water, stopping in the middle of the swinging footbridge to look up at the towering peaks on either side. We had climbed the switchback trail up the steep canyon face a few thousand feet until it joined an ancient Inca highway that paralleled the river below. It had been very hot once away from the rushing water, but Rick and I had not hurried, stopping every couple of switchbacks to smoke and admire the view. And when we'd stopped, topped out at the level stone paved road after about three hours, we were not tired, but exhilarated. A killer climb, but an Inca road in the wild Andes, wow. A short walk of 10 minutes or so brought us to the cluster of ruins among which we now sat, perched on the stone foundation of an Inca house built long ago on the very lip of a rock jutting out of the canyon wall. What a sight. Sky above and below, wild mountains all around, across the canyon, the Andes hurled skyward, one peak so tall that we never saw the summit because roiling, lightning flashing, clouds swirled about it the day long. Immediately to our left, the canyon had been terraced in ancient days and the tourist hungry government of today had recently cleared away underbrush, allowing native flowers to flourish and fill the terraces. Insects filled the flowers. To our right and a bit, uh, back a bit, a small waterfall gurgled to combine with the breeze and the insect drone into the perfect musical accompaniment for the spot. They'll probably get here in the late afternoon, I replied after some time. I hope they're not jerks. We basked in the sun, remarking desultorily on the spider that trapped and wrapped and dragged off his lunch, and the occasional iridescent blue flash that signaled a butterfly fluttering thousands of feet below. But after only an hour and a half or so, our serenity was punctuated by marching feet. We weren't happy with such an early arrival, having expected the arduous climb to prolong our solitude until near nightfall, but we greeted the hiker civilly. He was loaded with camera gear and packing gear, wearing hiking boots, shorts, and a cap. Puffing only slightly, he marched directly to our perch. Ich bin Reinhold. It's a wonderful walk, no? Wonderful exercise. It's good. Uh, yeah, yeah, great climb. A little steep, though, I said. Nein, nein, ist nix. Yeah, ein little rock. He hadn't dropped his gear and stood as if ready to climb on. Did you come alone? Rick and I asked the question on both our minds. Meine Freundin kommen, wir sind wir. He didn't stay for more chit-chat. Perhaps the language put him off, although we speculated that he wanted to get away so he could sit down and take off the, his load, but 
He walked a short distance to the temple ruins where partially standing walls and a makeshift roof sheltered our sleeping bags, and he went through the doorway and out of sight. Super German, I said. Yeah, he must have run up the mountain without stopping to look once, Rick replied, before he went back to idly considering the frequent lightning and the storm cloud boiling across the canyon and whether it might reach us. After an hour or a bit more, perhaps 3.30, a second walking backpack arrived. He looked rather haggard as he approached, and when he reached our eyrie, he dropped in a heap and drew ragged breaths for a few minutes before speaking. I'm Gerhard. Quite a climb, very healthy. Good walk. Where are the others? I'm not sure I understood Reinhold, but I thought there were four of you in your group. I waited a bit for him to catch his breath. Yeah, you understood. I'm the only one who speaks some English. We're traveling together from Germany. And the others are coming, but not so quick. They are not in the shape of Reinhold and me. Nice walk, yeah, yeah, very nice climb. This poor man was still shaking in his limbs after 10 minutes rest, so Rick got him some water. After a short time more, he dragged his cameras and gear across to the shelter where Reinhold was making tea. Dusk came, and we left our perch to brew some tea too and to maintain our sleeping spaces. We were with the two Germans when the third hiker arrived. He came in after sunset, wobbling and unable to speak as he crumpled by the fire. This is Hans, Gerhardt explained. Rick offered him some tea, and after some time sprawled and panting, Hans spoke in, uh, Gerhardt translated him. Rudy is lying on the trail where it joins the Inca Road. I'm going, I'm doing okay. It's a really marvelous walk, but I'm afraid Rudy pushed too hard. For some time we sat, Reinhold looking fit, Gerhardt looking ragged, but pulling camp chores, and Hans collapsed in the spot where he had first fallen by the fire. When it was almost full dark, Rick stood saying, I'm going to walk back up the trail. Me too, I said, I had to see. I come, this was from Gerhardt. It was starting to cool down with the sun gone and it made for a pleasant stroll of the flowers in the terraces along the path, releasing the fragrance of the day's sunshine with some bird or animal making night calls. We found Rudy just as Hans had described, crumpled at the lip of the trail, cameras and gears shed in a pile by his side. Gerhardt and Rudy spoke for a while there was some discussion, then Gerhard introduced us and explained, Rudy does not want to go to camp. He says he cannot move and wishes to stay here where he has fallen. In the end, we convinced Rudy that he could make it the short distance over level road to the ruins, the ruins where there was a roof in case of rain, the ruins where a fire was burning to dispel the cold.